Hello, hello. Good morning, guys. Welcome to the stream. Let's see how we go today uh, with the fall of social media. <laughs> um, I know that uh, this is not connecting right now to Facebook as it is down, but we still have um, people from YouTube and uh, what's the other one? Twitch. <laughs> all right. Let me know if you can see and hear me all right. And we can go ahead and get started. Hey, Jevin, how you doing? Alrighty, cool. So, um, don't really know like where we can go with this today. Um, I just thought for some reason I kind of like woke up like, and I remember the um, that I wanted to try out some stuff with kind of like a fantasy creature type of character. Um, and I thought maybe let's do kind of like a remake. Um, I will try to do my own version of the uh, the creature from Pan's Labyrinth um, from Del Toro's movie. And maybe it would be a it would be a cool thing to to try out. Yeah, man, all good, all good here. Uh, we're still here in in lockdown here in Melbourne, but fortunately, there's work and um, there's health, so all good, all good. All right, so um, yeah, <laughs> I have the I have the chat next to me as always. So if you have any questions, uh, feel free to put them in the chat. I'm gonna go ahead and just jump right into kind of like a blocking and yeah, and get started with this. All right, so I'm gonna select the move brush and the accu curve just so that I get that pointy effect. Symmetry, uh, yeah, symmetry in the x-axis. Um, I know that a lot of people don't really use that accu curve. Um, it's kind of like annoying sometimes when you want to just do like little movements because it creates those little bumpy areas. But when you're blocking something, at least for me, uh, because I tend to go for like stylized stuff, it sort of exaggerates like corners and, and it allows me to figure out planes a lot faster than without the accu curve. That's the reason I like to block things out. But I know it's not a popular choice. Uh, I'm going to bring in the gizmo as well. And I'm going to hold control, click and drag. Just push this down. This is gonna be kind of like the the jaw of the creature, something like that. And I do have some references uh, of that creature. Uh, I'll bring them in here just so you know um, what I'm talking about. So again, is this is the idea to do something like this, uh, and that allows us to, you know, play a little bit with that um, deformation and that exaggerated feature. Uh, of the creature, uh, possibly some kind of hair, stylized hair, as well as the horns. Um, so yeah, I think this could be a good way to, you know, something interesting to work on. But it's not going to be exactly the same. It's going to be kind of like my own version. I'll try to um, hit certain, you know, reference points like the, like these swirly things here on the forehead, and obviously the the shape of the horns, and maybe that obviously almond shape exaggerated eyes, which is pretty cool, but it's going to be slightly different anyway. Just wanted to show you what I have uh, right next to me. So yeah, this is going to be the the jaw of that creature. And I'm going to hold control and click and drag. And that also allows me to block in that very um, pronounced, yeah, the, the it's, it's kind of like part of the, <laughs> the nose as well, but um, it's also part of the forehead as well. Um, and I also have this uh, reference in here. Uh, I build this myself, and this is really easy to do. You can just select um, a mesh that you want. So I just took a a mesh of this um, skull, like the, the skeleton, um, and I went to preference, uh, cam view, and in here you can just click on make cam view, and it will just, uh, series will take uh, different shots. I think it takes eight different images from eight different angles and eight different inclinations I think it is uh, I'm not entirely sure and that it create that creates this so you can just rotate around uh, or from the actual cam view you can click and and move things around so it's pretty handy for this type of things um, and you can do the same thing for multiple you know versions of that uh, camera uh, which is pretty cool <laughs> okay so um, I think that's that's looking all right I'm gonna hold control, click and drag. Uh, we can dynamesh this maybe with a less resolution. 
that's all right. I'm also going to bring in a cylinder. That's going to be the neck, like the beginning of that neck. And by the way, you don't have to, like if you're, let's say, following along, trying to do similar stuff, you don't have to do this this way, like with, uh, with primitives. I just think it's a pretty nice and easy way to, to go about it, but obviously you can use anything, um, you know, you can leave it as it is, and if you want to extrude the rest of the body, you can uh, mask some areas and, and start pushing things. But playing around with the primitives, I want to bring in another cylinder. Um, I think it's just a lot easier to block things in, like understand what the, the shapes are. So this is going to be the, kind of like the chest. And of course, we can then tweak the rest later. All right. So let's go ahead and merge everything down. So I'm going to go to merge down. OK, merge down. OK. Let's go ahead and redynamesh everything at the same resolution. Uh, in fact, we can unify things and redynamesh once more. And the unified button is on the deformation palette. I use that all the time um, just to keep everything within the the ideal measurement um, for zeros. So if I turn on the, the floor, you see that now this piece roughly fits a two by two area. So um, that's the ideal, well, not the ideal, but it's, it's, it's an, yeah, well, it's, it's an ideal um, size for a mesh within zeros to work so that all the brushes and everything works, um, works fine uh, or better. So I'm just going to go ahead and hold the shift key to smooth things out a bit and start blocking this a bit better. But you see, this is extremely low res um, and also it's not very, you know, not very well defined um, anywhere. In fact, I'm just like kind of like losing those different spheres that I had before, but that's all part of the process, really. Kind of like that sort of almost triangular face shape. So that's what I'm going to go for on a, on a very narrow jaw. I think I'm going to stylize it even more, like just push the stylization and make it a very, like a bit more elongated. So that's the point <laughs> at this at this stage is just to play around with those shapes. And because I have everything in a very low res mesh, or like there's not a lot of points that I need to move. Uh, doing those quick changes with a large brush, a large brush that is usually the move brush for me, uh, you know, it's very, very easy. And then I can just smooth things out. Um, let's go ahead and bring in the knife lasso and cut an area like so. Let's do it again. Redynamish all of that just to, yeah, just have a fun way using that, the, that new tool, um, to set up the, the bust of this. All right. Cool. So let's go ahead and increase the resolution. Redynamesh. Uh, I'm going to apply one of these macros. Uh, this macro X5 for me is, it just takes whatever I have in here and it smooths everything like uh, as a general smooth five times. So it literally goes to deformation, uh, smooth here, and then it just does this slider uh, five times. So that's what, um, that's what I just did there. Just that camera. Cool. All right. So now that I have a bit more resolution, this is smoother. Um, I can keep blocking this thing in. So I can use the damn sander brush, and I'm gonna try to, you know, place this, the eyes straight away, so that that gives me 
uh, a visual anchor point of where to place the rest of the stuff. As well as the nose, maybe. The mouth. All right, very. Very basic block out, but those cuts um, definitely help. And another thing that I like to do um, straight away when, 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 I'm, when I'm working with characters at least um, is set up the eyes if the character has eyes. So uh, an easy way to do it is from the macro. You can click on macros, click on append eyes, and it will append these spheres with a with a color and material ready. And I'm gonna enable local symmetry. And then just place this inside this skull. Right now it's looking more like um, Abe from Hellboy, I think. All right. And I'm gonna go ahead and give it a different color straight away. So now that I have that reference point, um, I can bring in my move brush again, and I'm going to start adjusting things now that I know where the, the eyes are and the shape that I want to have for the eyes. So it has a very prominent kind of like sigmatic arch here, the cheekbone area. Go ahead and define the eyes a little bit better here. And for example, for this area with the, even though I have like a very low res uh, mesh as a base, holding the Alt key with the damn standard brush, it sort of pushes everything out. So that's how I can quickly build a reference for the eyelids here. But this is still pretty, you know, those, those lines are not necessarily going to be there. Um, again, it's just so that I can block in everything else. So I think that as a starting point um, works just fine. So let's go ahead now and start doing a bit more sculpting. So I'm going to redynamize this with a bit more resolution. And I'm going to use my custom clay brush, which is just a, it has some simple settings that speeds up the process and it doesn't give me that many. Um, let me just give you an example, just so that you know what brush I'm using. So this is my custom clay brush uh, or clay tube brush. So if you compare that with the clay builder brush, which you know is something that I still use anyway, you see that one, like the one that I have for myself, like the custom brush doesn't have that many like lines in between, um, and it's a little bit stronger, and it has uh, it, it has less fade towards the the edges. Uh, so if I select mine, so do that, I can do more of this. And it's not going to look as uh, sketchy. So it feels more like the clay, the normal clay, but it builds volume really quickly. Um, so that's the reason I have that. And you can just do that by changing a couple of settings. One of the settings I change is this roll distance in the stroke palette. 
Um, but that's that's about it, really. I think I have a, a couple more settings, but they're not nothing like too complicated. I don't think they're gonna affect things much. I just don't remember <laughs> what they are. So I'm gonna define the mouth area and a bit of the maybe the bottom lips. Oh, the bottom lip and the top lip. That also helps me to to figure out the protrusion of the of this nose. And this is something that I, uh, when it comes to to sculpting, this is something that I like to do often as well, uh, which is blend blend things, um, like having strokes that go, that overlap. Um, I'm gonna explain that. So I try to do, <laughs> I try to follow like a specific flow, like in this case, what I'm doing right here, right? To build the the base of that portion of the of the of the mesh and then I go with perpendicular strokes covering that uh, with less pressure and that sort of like cleans things up as well and adds a bit more volume so I don't know if that makes sense but that's what I tend to do I'm gonna turn this down a bit because that's another that's another tip for you. Or I don't know if it is a tip, but it's a it's something that I like to do with a lot of the a lot of the tools that I use. I like to push things to the limit <laughs> or exaggerate things and then knock it down and and go back and refine them. So you know if the if this design um, and it applies the same whether it is a tool or if it is an actual design that you're doing. Um, so in this case, it has very exaggerated sort of cheekbones. So I, I make sure that that is there from the very beginning as a as a key feature, but I know that I'm doing it like quite exaggerated. So I can come back and, and refine that later. All right, I'm gonna exaggerate the eyes as well, like make them a bit larger. And I think I'm gonna have to increase the size of these spheres a bit more. All right, something like that. I don't know if the if there is anyone is there anyone in Twitch that um just want to double check that there is Twitch happening Twitch Twitch oh, awesome thanks <laughs> all good so yeah we have um we have Twitch and we have YouTube. Don't know what's going on with, with Facebook. Looks like everything everything in Facebook is down. Well, all the Facebook stuff is down. How is that possible? Which um, my gizmo? It's you just click on move, scale, rotate. That's that's how you bring the gizmo.
So yeah, not a lot of tricks or or tips today. I think this is just gonna be more like a chilling sculpting session, like tweaking volumes. I'll I'll try to I mean I'll try to move faster. Um just so you can see a bit more of a polish piece or a polish sketch. Uh, maybe I can show you a couple of you know what, now that I think of there there might be some interesting things that I can show you with this. Gonna read dynamics now. All right, I think I'm gonna enable perspective now. Um, sh I should have done before and start softening some of these lines as well. Doesn't matter if I lose a bit of the definition as part of the, the process as well. Um, because what I like to do now, again, before going any further with the, you know, redesign of this, this character, um, is to complete kind of like the block out. So I'm going to set up the the horns and maybe the uh the the little ears or something and yeah and then we can just continue from there um uh, can the gizmo do everything the transpose line does jebin um yeah it can do pretty much anything that the transpose line does what it cannot do is the the awesome like extra things that the transpose line has, uh, like like the alt, uh, the deformation. Um, what's the name? The, the the alternative deformation that you have with the with the transpose line, just because there is no there's no pivot point other than this the actual pivot point of the. Let me just show you. So basically, with the with the gizmo, you have like a single point, right? Like a single pivot point, and you can obviously move that point away, around, and rotate, and all of that. But with the transpose line, you can actually have different different points. So this is the only thing that the trans the sorry the gizmo cannot do. So um, with the gizmo, you can obviously rotate, and yeah, you can just oops, scale things in any axis and all of that. Um, but with the transpose line, let's say if you have like a finger or something, you can scale this this way or create a, a line that way. Um, and of course, you can go to rotate and you can click and drag from this point. So now this, this the first point that you click and drag, that's gonna be your pivot point to rotate. Uh, but if you click from here or if you press hold, it's just going to rotate from the center. So actually, let's put this one here. If you press Alt, it's going to do this rotation. It's not going to be very easy to see. Let's put it closer here. This is going to rotate from that point. So this new point becomes your, your pivot. So you can do these type of things. Um, it's probably going to be easier if I just break it here. right? So if I did a finger, you can go ahead and do that. Um, so you can place this, say, around there where the knuckle would be, right? Click Alt, and it's just going to rotate like so. Um, and you can do the same thing, let's say, if you mask things out like that. It becomes your pivot point. Um, so this is the type of thing. Maybe it's not very easy with the with the topology that I have, but um, that's the type of things that the gizmo cannot do. However, like if you bring in the gizmo, right? Um, oops. 
the gizmo has all of these awesome deformers that the transpose line doesn't have. So they're like different tools, really, to move things around. Um, so hopefully that answers the questions. Oh, this, oh, all right. So this thing that you can see here on the top right, that is not the gizmo or it's not called the gizmo. It's called um, the cam view. So it allows you to see, like click and drag to see the different angles that you have. Um, so you can do that very easily. Just, uh, you know, I can turn this cam view into the pan labyrinth thing. So um, I can show you that. Let me just create. Um, I want to show you how to do the, the horns first or the... Let's do the ears first because the ears, I think, are going to be easier. So um, um, I want to try to show you something cool and different. I'm going to append a cylinder. Go into solo mode and turn off perspective. I'm going to rotate things around, holding shift to snap and scale it like so. So this is going to be the initial area of the... Yeah, this is going to be the block out of that, um, of that ear. Hopefully this is going to work. Um, and I'm going to use the mask, uh, sorry, the knife lasso. So let's go ahead and look at it from the top. And that's why these cam views are pretty good. So you can just rotate and you know that now you're looking at this from the top. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and cut kind of like the shape of that ear. So let me bring in. The epic pen. Hey Derek, um, now you're not late. We're just getting started. All right. So this is kind of like the the idea. Um, so you have something like that. <laughs> so that's gonna be the the ear. I mean. It's a bit more interesting than that, but it's kind of like it wraps around. Let me just do it properly. It's kind of like this. That's kind of like the ear. So um, the, the shape, like the basic shape, would fit a cylinder pretty easy. That's, what, that's the reason I have that. Um, and then what we can do with the knife is kind of like from the top, we can cut this shape out and maybe a little bit of that shape and that will give us you know a good starting point i don't know if this visually makes sense but you'll see in a second so uh, knife lasso hold control and shift and let's go ahead and do that oops So I'm just I'm just cutting pieces that I don't need. Just trying to think about that um that shape that I sort of drew before. Uh, I think I'm gonna leave that one as it is, and maybe something like that. Although. This could be done uh, later on. Right. <laughs> so doesn't look like I and like an ear at all <laughs> just yet, um, but that's kind of like the next. The next step so um, in fact if we could go ahead and turn on the polyframe you'll see we have a bunch of polyframe or poly groups that uh, are created with the knife lasso and the topology is pretty pretty nice it's kind of like a boolean operation anyway so uh, what material am i using um, the ba basic material i like to keep it simple within grace uh, when i'm sculpting it just allows me to see the volumes a lot better and I usually jump between uh, this material, the basic one, the basic material with a highlight, and the matcap gray. So those are the three 
unless I'm doing something more hard surface related. That's, um, I actually have a bunch more, but I haven't, like this space is for adding more of these materials um, in the UI that I use often. Uh, I just don't, haven't had a chance to add them because I do have a bunch of other materials, um, like custom materials that I haven't added, but those are the ones that come into this area. Uh, anyway, so uh, like I was saying, I have now these, this polyframe. So something else you can do, and that's probably an easier way to, to block things out in this case, is hold control and shift. Uh, let's select the select rectangular piece or brush. And let's turn on double. So you can select that, right? So just this polygroup. And I'm going to delete hidden. So now we have a single sided mesh, right? Um, and I probably can remove this as well. So I'm going to use the select lasso to hide that. Maybe that triangle there. Yep, and delete hidden. So now we have this tube weird thing that doesn't look like anything, but we can very easily, because this is obviously a much simpler geometry, we can remesh that. Uh, we can click on half. And now we have a, a pretty decent mesh. We can also go ahead and polish or smooth things. And let's do another remesh. All right. So that's a pretty simple way to go about it. Um, and now we have this base mesh that we can go ahead and use, let's say something like the move brush. And I'm, I'm gonna start giving it a bit more of that nice rounded shape for the ear and do another remesh. So every time that I adjust things, I can remesh. And this is a, a, you know, a concept that not a lot of people that I know of um, using ZBrush adhere to, which is the fact that the serial measure can be used as, as another sketching tool just to keep things clean. Um, in fact, um, I believe one of the, the workflows from, uh, from Shane, for example, from Shane Olson, uh, I think he's streaming today as well. He, uh, he uses that pretty much in the same way. So he keeps everything clean and um, simple by simply just <laughs> Uh, remeshing things, right? So that's another way that you can keep things um, like sketching, but keeping things clean, right? So in, instead of redyna meshing, I'm remeshing. <laughs> that's it. All right. So um, I'm going to go ahead and enable dynamic for this, and I'm going to increase the thickness. So that's going to give me the thickness of that ear. Um, I'm also going to disable post of division, so it's a little bit smoother. And all of those settings for you guys are on the geometry dynamic subdivision. So this is the post subdiv that basically applies the the subdivision or the smoothness before it before it applies the subdivision. <laughs> Makes sense. So basically the switch turns this on and off. Uh, if you leave it on, it's going to kind of like trying to keep those just a little bit sharper, but I want this to be more organic, which is fine. Um, Did you recently release a video on physical materials scans? So I think randomly stumbled onto your work a few days ago. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, of course. It's not, um, yeah, it's a physical, they're not, well, yeah, I, I suppose there are scans. Um, it's using the 3D sampler. Um, it's, a, it's a workshop, actually. There are eight videos to create like a pottery scene. So the actual, the actual meshes um, are done in ZBrush. And those are available from the video, so you can download them and, and follow along. But yeah, it is a workshop to create your own PBR materials, um, texture in Substance Painter, and then render in 3D Stager, uh, which is pretty cool. All right, so now that I have this, I'm, I can bring in the gizmo, bring in the gear icon, and I can play around with things like the taper deformer. All right, so I can do this. So I'm going to get this closer there. Maybe increase the size of this a bit. accept and do the same thing but this time I'm going to use the twist deformer and that already start to look more like that shape of that ear and we can also do uh, let's try bend arc for example from the green one we can bend this a tiny bit more just to add you know that sense of gravity 
accept. And all of those things that we've been doing are done in this very simple mesh, right? That it has dynamic subdivision. So that's what looks so so clean so far. Um, you know, and all of these effects are pretty easy to do. Um, so I think I'm gonna scale this in this fashion as well. And I'm gonna use the move topological that respects the continuity of the topology, obviously. And that way, or, you know, we can also mask things as well. Let's just mask things. I'm gonna do something like that to mask this area, blur it a little bit, and that way I can sort of try to overlap this a little bit more. All right, so that's, that's kind of like one way to go about it. I think it's, it's looking better. And now at this point, I'm just like nudging things with the move brush so that it's not as, yeah, not as perfect, like a tubular shape. And it feels more like, like an organic, organic thing. All right, and we can still, you know, apply the dynamics of the vision and, and, you know, sculpt this if we wanted to. I'm gonna hold the Alt key and place the pivot point around there. Bring back the rest of my tools, scale this, oops. Um, okay, so <laughs> now that I scale this, I'm gonna actually change the thickness. So I'm gonna turn off dynamic for a second, scale this down, and let's go ahead and place this. So you see, just by doing this, it really helps to, you know, get closer to that effect or to that um, character that we're trying to do. And I'm going to keep it separate so that I can move things around a little bit easier if I need to. Um, but now that we have placed this, let's go ahead and enable that that um, dynamics of division, <laughs> we have like a very swollen ear, but not, all we have to do is play with the thickness. And that's the beauty of playing or keeping things with, um, keep it simple with the dynamic. All right. So now I'm gonna use the move topological and I'm gonna start moving things to try to integrate this better with the actual head. Uh, but everything still is is part of the dynamic, which is cool. Still, it might be a little bit too big, but anyway, we'll see. Um, we can also mirror and weld, and would keep everything. So ultimately, what we're mirroring and welding together is just that single-sided mesh, right? I'm just gonna double check, yeah, that it's a double-sided mesh. So I just checked the, the normals, but yeah, this is exactly what I need. Um, and keep that dynamic. Cool. All right, so <laughs> little by little, we, we start to get there with the, with the blocking. Um, let's go ahead and do the, the horns. And um, I think I can show you some pretty cool stuff as well to, to block the horns and, and then we can keep refining this. Um, <laughs> yeah, cool, no worries, man. Hey, Paulo, how are you doing today? No worries. Uh, all good. All good, Jeff. Thanks for asking. Yeah, it's a it's a goat, man. It's it's actually base. Uh, I'm kind of like redoing my own version of the, the character from the Pan's Labyrinth uh, from Del Toro movie. Um, yeah, <laughs> so we'll see how we go. Anyway, let's go ahead and start with the with the horn. And there's so many different ways that you can go about it, uh, about creating a complicated or, a, uh, or an organic shape like a like a horn. Uh, personally, if I was to do this for a concept or you know part of my freelance work, I would probably use a C spheres that gives me a greater um, a greater amount of control about the shapes, uh, like how I want to create the shapes. Uh, but an easy, as well, an easy way to go about it, and that is pretty cool, is using primitive um, deformers. 
So I'm going to click on the tool. Let's clear this up a little bit. Uh, I'm going to use this spiral 3D probably. Yeah, let's do spiral. And as you see, most of my UI at the bottom, which uh, has to do with editing meshes, uh, disappear. So if I switch between these mesh that I can edit, you see in my UI, everything that I have here at the bottom is to affect the mesh or edit the mesh. So I have DynaMesh or remeshing stuff. Um, I can divide things, you know, dynamics of the vision, all of that. So that affects the actual mesh. If I switch to a primitive, all of those things or most of those things go away because yeah, this this is a this is not a mesh that you can sculpt on. This is just a primitive. So um, the advantage of this thing is that we can go to the bottom, to the initialize tab, and we can play around with these values. So this is a a math represent like a visual representation of a math equation <laughs> or a math um yeah <laughs> like a math um like a like a matrix or something. So basically you can take all of these uh, values and change them like so. So you can change the thickness, you can change the the amount of subdivision, the coverage, right? So that's, those are the things that I'm gonna tweak uh, quickly to produce the initial shape of that horn, right? All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and change the coverage something like that so that that already gives you an idea maybe not that much uh, by the way you can click on this edge and that makes the whole thing hollow um i think the thickness is fine and i'm gonna play with the let's turn on polyframe as well i'm gonna play with the the twisting i'm gonna twist things a bit And what else we can do? We can we can displace the radius. So basically with this radius thing, yeah. So this radius allows you to change, um, let's say if I set it to zero, this endpoint, mm, how can I, let me just explain this because this is a, a quite, quite a cool tool. Uh, actually, hang on. So if you think about this whole thing as a as a circle that has a point in the middle, like a pivot, you can change this radius to take, let's say, the end of this curve outwards, or like in this case, where this, this way, right? Or scale the whole thing inwards. This actually doesn't make much sense if I do it like this. If I just show you, if I want to make this this part of the horn uh, get closer to the to the root, I just increase that radius like so, right? And then I can play with the other one to push it in, right? So the left hand side in these sliders has to do with the root or the base. That's why the base is the one that is moving, and the one on the right hand side has to do with the tip or the end of this curve. So you can you know, flip the the orientation of this. But you know, what I had is mostly what I what I need. I just wanna change things a tiny bit. All right, and this um, this distance. So this is kind of like a displacement from this. Let's call this the floor, right? Um, and we're just pushing things up or down. Right, so right now I think, if I'm not mistaken, the displacement sit at one and zero. Again, they have to do, or they have to, um, this displays these sliders. They have to do with the base and the tip. So in theory, if I change this, yeah, I'm just displacing this, this base, right? So at zero, they're kind of like at the same uh, level, but I can displace the top or the tip, right? So I can push that up or down, like I said before. I don't know. That makes sense. So I can play with this displacement of just the tip, pushing it up or pushing it down, and the same thing with the with the bottom, up or down. So that allows me to very quickly, if I use both, create that sort of curly effect, right, of the pan's labyrinth um, shape. 
Um, and maybe the coverage is still too much, so I can just reduce it a bit, right? And keep playing with that displacement. Um, another thing that you can use is, okay, you have the thickness for the tip as well. So you can add a bit of thickness as well, which I think is best for this initial setup and maybe add more of a thickness, right? So obviously I spend <laughs> quite a bit of time just because I'm explaining uh, or trying to, to show you what these things um, do. But once you have a, you're familiar with these type of things, it's very easy to come to a uh, spiral 3D. That's the one that I use uh, as a primitive and tweak these things very, very quickly and produce something like that. Um, you can also change the amount of subdivision. So, you know, make it a bit more low res, which I think is fine in this case. And once you're happy, you, you can click on Make Polymesh 3D. So now this is a mesh that you can use. Um, before I move that into the current tool that we're using to create that head, uh, I can go ahead and clean this up a little bit more. Now this is a mesh that you can edit. So I can go to that tip area and hold the smooth brush just to smooth that out. Uh, the base, I think, is fine as it is. Um, yeah, I think this this works. All right, so let's go ahead and copy and paste. And that already, I think this this is the last bit that we needed to to really understand what character we're trying to to build here um, i'm going to press um, place the pivot closer to the base so that is a lot easier to manipulate Looking at it, I think if we go back to this one, I think I need to exaggerate the the displacement of this a bit more. So let's go back here. And let's do it again. I'm going to create a folder um, called the OR with the originals. You know, if you follow along with the with previous streams that I've done, you know that that's something that I do often. Uh, just to keep the originals in there. All right, let's do that. Same deal with this. Yeah, I think that this one works a little bit better. All right, so um, just so that we can see a lot better what way we're trying to do, I'm going to mirror, mirror and weld. Um, I'm used to do it this way. So I'm used to, if I'm working on the right-hand side of the of what I can see on the screen, I like to mirror and then mirror and weld. But in the latest versions of ZBrush, it doesn't really matter. I'm just used to the process. If you have something on the right-hand side beforehand, um, you couldn't mirror it, but now Sirush is intelligent enough to say, okay, if you don't have anything on this side, I'm assuming that you want to mirror and weld it to that side. So, uh, but I'm just used to mirror things on the left hand side first and then do it on the other side, but you don't have to. Cool. All right. So let's, um, let's adjust this when I enable symmetry. I'm going to start pushing things a bit just to make it a bit more organic. Um, and I also want to go for a more stylized shape. So I'm just going to try to go for more like a, not as, not as rounded anyway. And I'm not too worried about the, the topology or anything just yet as in 
this is probably I don't know if it's gonna be the final one. So I'm pushing things just concentrating on the volumes. That's the that's the main thing here. And because this is a, a curly mesh, kind of like revolving around itself, is is in this case in particular, it's really important to look at it from all sorts of angles. All right. So um. Again, we might have to at this point I'm gonna I'm gonna exaggerate my thumbnail. So this one right here on the left hand side I can click and drag. Um and that allows me, you know, it rotates the same way as the three D view. Um but it allows me to sort of concentrate a bit more on that silhouette so I can just look at it and and concentrate on those adjusting those empty spaces a bit more. Everything feels a bit more unified, I suppose. That's the that's what I'm getting at. You can go back to the to the ears, also with symmetry. Push that up as well. All right, so not bad. Let's go ahead and um, give these horns something a bit more interesting to, <laughs> to work with. So um, I'm going to go into solo mode. And I'm going to duplicate this, keep that in the original folder if we need to. Uh, but I'm going to remove one side so that we can focus on just one and then mirror and weld it. So delete hidden. Um, and for this one, what I want to do is give it some quick UVs and that allows me to use another tool called the morph UV so that I, I can literally just add details to it in a flat surface which is pretty easy uh, in this you know I mean you can go to dynamic or just subdivide this like so and then go with the standard brush for example and start doing these type of things that's not very obvious let's do it with the damn standard Right, you can do that sort of thing, um, which is fine. But there's an, uh, another way to approach it, and I think it's a lot easier. Which is when you have this as a flat surface, you can just, um, you know, apply, it, for example, something like interpolate. We can try that. Let's, let's, yeah, let's go ahead and try it. So obviously we need um, quick UVs for this. So what I'll do is I'm gonna select my C modeler, and I'm gonna hold the Alt key, select all of those. And we can go to poly polygroup, click on that, and that creates a different polygroup. Um, and we can do the same thing for the the tip. Uh, or you know you don't have to use the uh, the the C model. <laughs> you can use the select lasso, just doing that. And you can do a group visible or regroup visible. So now we have three different polygroups. So now we can click on the UV plugin, sorry, the C plugin, and then go to the UV master plugin. So this one right here, and I can click on polygroups. So if I enable this, series is gonna split things based on the polygroups. I'm gonna unwrap, that's it. And now I have these morph UVs uh, switch, which for you guys would be under the tool palette, uh, UV map, this morph UV, so this one right here. And if I click on that, it's just gonna give me that version, right? So that's that's kind of like what I need. However, I wanna be able to control the outer the outer area and the inner area of that horn, right? So just to 
to add different types of details and different ridges or lines. So we can control that as well with the way that we place the, the loops, right? And that is the reason why when I was setting up the, um, I should have mentioned that, <laughs> when I was setting up the primitive, I did a little bit of twisting. Uh, so <laughs> let me show you uh, here. So you see, you see that this line starts here at this point, uh, but it follows kind of like the edge around. So that that allows me to, um, what I'm gonna do now is differentiate what the inner and the outer area of that horn is. Um, and that is a very easy thing to do from that primitive um, using the twist. So you can do that, you can exaggerate that or you can remove it all together if you don't wanna have that twisting effect. Uh, but that's the idea and the reason I went ahead and did that twisting from there. All right, so we can go ahead and isolate this polygroup using, you know, hold control and shift to isolate that polygroup. Let's enable double. So now we have that isolated. We can click on select lasso. And I'm just gonna go for, I'm gonna target, let's see. I'm gonna target maybe this one. So holding control and shift. Um, if you have the select lasso and you click on an edge, it's gonna isolate that edge loop, right? So now you see it goes all the way there and I'm gonna do the same thing for this side, maybe maybe from here, I think it should be fine. Yep. All right, so now we have isolated two loops and what I'd like to do is we can auto group Right, let's go back to select rectangular. So if I bring everything back, now we have the one at the base, the one at the tip, that those ones don't really matter. Um, but it's necessary in this case that we have a tubular shape so that it is easy for the unwrapping uh, algorithm to recognize that you know we can unwrap this tubular shape in a more consistent way. And now we have one, two, and three different polygroups in here. And all I have to do is just merge some of these together. So you can choose which ones, right? Sorry, I probably should have used that material. So I think if I hold Control and Shift and select this one, I can invert it and also hide this bit. Uh, maybe it is too thick. No, actually it's fine. Yeah. I'm just thinking that the inner area should be thinner. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, you know what? We can isolate. We can isolate these um, the two loops. Those are the ones that we that we hit with the select lasso, and we can also do an auto group. So that way, we can add one of those loops to the outer area and one of those loops to the um, to the inner area. So the blue one and the purple one. Let's go ahead and click on auto groups with this one selected, and then the same thing for these two. So auto group. All right, so that took a little bit longer than what I was hoping, but now we have two different polygroups for the outer and the inner area of the horn. We have the base and the tip, which they don't really matter at this point. Um, those ones, you won't see this one, and this one is so tiny that we can we can manually fix it later. Uh, so this is what we currently have. If I morph that UV, so you see it is not following that inner or outer area, and it breaks around here, but now we can go ahead and do the same thing. So unwrap, that's gonna just be very quickly because we have a you know, very simple mesh. And now we have the two pieces separately that we can um, rearrange. So one thing I like to do to, to adjust this a little bit better and be able to work and apply you know, any sculpting method to this is to uh, rearrange the UV within ZBrush and, and use this, uh, this tool. So uh, first thing is going to be, um, the first step would be to turn off perspective. I'm gonna also turn on the floor. Uh, that's gonna give me a grid. And let's turn the Z axis, in this case, on in the floor so that you see that, that grid. Um, I'm also gonna turn this bump, that, that bump is related to the morph UV, so it's next to the UV section here, set to zero. And that bump is just to, be able to visualize in that unwrap mode a little bit of those details that you're gonna create. 
uh, but at this point I just want to visualize the flat version and we come back to that so more of UV all right and I want to keep it there, but I'm just thinking that, yeah, let's, let's just keep it simple. So, um, the way that you can arrange this thing here as well, I'm going to enable that camera lock so that I don't move it accidentally is to bring in the gizmo, hold control and shift anything that has a different polygroup. So now I have that bit selected and I can just rotate things around like so, right? Um, the same thing with this one, hold control and shift and place that. It's not like, you know, the best UVs or anything, but it is, it is pretty decent for what we want to do. Alrighty. So now we can go back from that morph UV. Oh, sorry. Now this is not, this is not the way to do it. Um, that is just to visualize the Morph UV. So this is what I'm going to do next. That's not what I wanted to do. <laughs> so, um, sorry, let's uh, erase that last bit. Forget about that. Um, that's what I should have done afterwards. But to actually rotate and move things around in the UV space, you need to do it from the UV master. So I'm going to click on the clone or work on clone, right? So if I click on work on clone, so we're just going to create a separate tool, right? That has just that bit. So anything that we do here, then we can copy and paste those UVs. All right. So now, uh, instead of doing um, a UV mapping again or um, unwrapping, I'm going to click on flatten. That's the one that I'm looking for. So flatten, that's going to give you what I was trying to do manually, which is um, not ideal. <laughs> so that flatten will show you the flat version of the UV. It's the equivalent to click on Morph UV, but using the UV master, you can actually adjust the UVs. That's the, the issue. So, all right. So now we are here. Let's turn off or lock the camera so that you don't accidentally move that. Um, and the same deal, right? Bring the gizmo, hold control and shift to select it and readjust this. So now you can actually see where the edges of that UV map, right? Which is that cube. Um, so the UV master does a really good job in terms of uh, optimizing the space sometimes when you, yeah, when it works. <laughs> uh, but I'm not interested in, in applying texture or anything like that. I just want to have the ability to, to use this flat mode to, to sculpt really. So that's why I'm not worried about like pixel density of making sure that everything works nicely. I just want to be able to have a, a more like a horizontal placement and the bottom areas doesn't, they don't really matter. All right. So now if I on flatten, series is going to keep that placement of those UVs, right? Um, so all I have to do is copy UVs from the UV master, go into my working file in here, and I'm going to go ahead and paste UVs. There we go. So now this is this is the actual this the, the this is the actual horn, um, but if I enable the UV the morph UV you'll see it keeps that placement that we had. Great. So we're now back on track. Um, so what I want to do now is maybe um, I'm thinking that maybe I could just think about it. Let's do a mirror and weld, and that should keep the UVs. But for two, yeah, that's fine. Um, I don't know how that's gonna work with the with the flat version, but we'll see. <laughs> and I'm gonna go ahead and divide this a few times, just so that we have 72, maybe one more, 290,000 polygons in here. Um, and then we can use the damn standard brush, right? With symmetry. So we can do that sort of stuff, right? Uh, but if I now set this back to 50, which is what we had before, and go to Morph UV, let's go into solo mode. Um, if I go ahead and do the turn off symmetry here, uh, I forgot which one is the, I think this one is the inner one. So if I go ahead and do this, I'm, I'm going to do it very quickly just to show you 
what it does, right? I can have uh, a visibility of this this pattern in this flat version, and if I go ahead and turn this off, it get up, it gets applied to that um, to that region. So that's what I want to do, which is pretty cool, right? So let's undo that, um, and instead of just using the damn standard brush, um, just for fun, I'm going to use one of my custom brushes. Um, actually, before I do that, I also want to show you that you can do, so I'm going to do one line in here and another one in here to utilize one of the new tools in ZBrush. So before I move the camera on it or, or anything, any other stroke, uh, I have one, two, and I can bring in the interpolate and I have 10 strokes. Maybe I can increase that to 25. 26, click on interpolate, and series will interpolate from this point to this point. Obviously, because this is a flat uh, area, it's not ideal. Um, actually, let's go ahead and try that without the more of UV, see what what that does. The only thing is that we we cannot move the camera, so I'm going to do one line there and another one there, and interpolate. So that, yeah, that kind of works. But yeah, I prefer to do it with the Morph UV, so that's a lot better. Okay, so yeah, you can definitely go ahead and do interpolation like so. So play around with those uh, tools. Now you can see this interpolate um, a lot more consistently. So what I will do instead of using that, um, or we can use that as well, is bring in one of my custom brushes, I think, for this thing, I might use. Um, so this is this is a pack called the Creature Skin Brushes. So it's just a bunch of brushes that gives you like cool skin details like that for creatures, um, which you know could work nicely for this. Maybe if I press harder. Um, I'm also going to the depth. Uh, sorry, curve. Make sure that it's not wrap mode. Some of the brushes, um, if you if you own the pack, if you um, purchase these packs or you have any of these brushes and you notice that they are adding details somewhere else, um, that's all. It should be in the docu documentation, but all you have to do is go to the brush palette and turn off the wrap mode because uh, some of the brushes I left the wrap mode to one because I use them to generate more tileable textures than than actual you know details like this. But anyway, uh, let's see. Um, hey Paulo, sort of sort of off topic, but I'm gonna ask us the email of the Sirius Guides site didn't work. You have said before that you lock that you lock your camera. How do you do that? I can't seem to find that option. Uh, the lock camera is this button right here that I have in my UI in my UI. In a custom UI, I believe it should be on the right hand side in the sorry, standard UI, I believe it should be on the right hand side. Otherwise it is on the draw palette. Um I rem this one right here. So if you go to the draw palette, this is the lock camera view. Alrighty, so now I can start doing more of that, maybe with a smaller brush size. That's why I like to lock the camera so that I don't move that accidentally. All right, so you see that th this is just a quick and easy way to add this type of details um, with these brushes. Um, but you know, you can, I have a bunch of different things that we can play around with. Uh, and sometimes the, the reason I build these brushes, I originally do it for a project, for example, and I build them for myself. But when I'm refine them to make them into a pack that I can uh, share online and sell, um, I spend some time making sure that they can be used in anything really, or that I only choose the ones that I that I know will, will be of value for people, um, not just for that specific project that I worked on. So for example, if I use something like the the rocks, so this is another pack that has like heaps heaps of different brushes to, to create rocks in ZBrush. Um, the point that I'm trying to make here is that even if the pack says rocks in ZBrush, there's just like sculpting brushes, so you can use that in a whole bunch of different ways. So some of them can work as like maybe the bark for a tree, or in this case, we can refine details in the 
uh, yeah, in that form. So just to give you an example, I'm, I'm going to use this cliff builder in here, and that should give me a, a very different effect, a bit more, yeah, a bit stronger with some strong lines. Um, we might need to increase the resolution, but I'm not too worried at, at this point because when we re rewrap this thing, um, we're going to have a pretty difference, uh, a pretty big difference between the edges of this UV because we're literally just moving points, um, but not in in the same. Well, it's the same mesh, but we are. Uh, it's kind of like adding these details where where you have the rest of the piece mask in a way. Uh, all right, so. Just wanted to show you that that you can, you know, you can utilize all of these brushes, but in different ways. Um, so this is kind of like a good starting point. But I'm gonna use also another custom brush from the Geiger Pack, which you guys have. I mean, this brush is ultimately a, a strong version of the Slash Three. So what I'm gonna do now, you can do it with the Slash Three in ZBrush, which is somewhere <laughs> let's filter by the letter s slash three so this one right here is very similar to that uh, so this one allows me to sort of push things a lot faster and easier just to sharpen some of those ridges but hopefully you see that doing it this way once you have uvs it makes it a lot easier, lots, yeah, a lot faster at least the placement. Uh, I'm gonna do the same thing here at the top, although I think at the top we should be using maybe the standard brush, or um, I'm gonna use another custom brush from the Geiger Pack. Again, these brushes, most of the brushes that I do anyway, are to speed up workflows really. So you could exactly you could do the same thing that I'm doing really with. A standard brush and just increase the the strength, the the Z intensity. Um, but yeah, all of the brushes in this pack are just to improve the speed a bit. All right, so now I can go ahead and switch to the morph UV, and we have a pretty pretty nice set of details. Obviously, we have to go ahead and, like I said, the difference is because of the polyframe, right? Um, so we can go ahead and smooth this out. And that's the reason I didn't go all the way to one million polygon, because then smoothing this out would be a bit harder. And also, if you have a lot more details, when you try to smooth that, it's going to be pretty obvious that, you know, that's the smooth area. Whereas if you keep it simple, like I did, um, then we can refine this manually. Uh, sorry. Let's undo all of that. Forgot to to do it with symmetry. So this, yeah, <laughs> let's do it again. So I'm not too fast about removing some of the details that we added. Um, the main reason we added those details in the kind of like unflattened version of the on the mesh, or like the unwrapped version of the mesh is so that we can place the lines a bit more consistently, but they work as a reference point. So now we can manually, yeah, manually add the details following those, those lines, right? So let's, um, let's finish this up here. And if for some reason, by the way, if you for some reason have like more polygons than what I do, like you end up doing this with two million polygons, um, and it's hard to to see or hard to smooth this. You can use this smooth stronger. Uh, this is a smooth brush that comes with ZBrush, the smooth stronger, but it doesn't come with the the default opening of ZBrush, <laughs> like the default um, C startup. So what you can do is move that brush to the C startup folder into the brush presets, so that every time that you open ZBrush, it appears there. Uh, but otherwise, you can go to the Lightbox brushes, um, smooth, uh, smooth stronger, and double click that. So that's that comes with ZBrush, and that obviously, as you can see, smooth things a lot faster. 
So you might think, oh, what's the point of doing all those details in that unwrap mode if you're going to have to smooth all of that? Um, and yeah, you're right. But <laughs> again, what I want to have is that sort of consistent pattern of those lines. And now I can use the same tools, right? I can use something, uh, which one did we use before? The This creature. Um, I'm going to turn off these things now. Um, I can use these brushes to do the same thing. Just add those details in here, but I can follow the lines, right? Um, and in fact, if I don't want to, let's say I don't want to go on top of the the top area of the horn, uh, what I can do is hold Control and Shift to isolate that mask. And now I can go ahead and blur that mask or, you know, shrink that mask a bit. Maybe let's shrink it first. And now we have protected that area, which is cool. And at this point, we can, if we wanted to, um, we can go ahead and increase the resolution a bit. But I'll do that later. Just want to continue the, the refinement process. Like at this stage, we I feel like we're still blocking, right? It's um, it's a longer process, but if the base works, then the rest works. All right, now I'm gonna invert that and do the same thing here, but I'm gonna use the other brush just for fun. Um, in fact, let's clear that mask. And I'm going to show you something else that is pretty cool. So I'm going to divide this to what? 1 million polygon. Let's double check. Um, maybe one more. So now we have 4 million polygons and pretty pretty high res mesh, right? And and again, this brush that I'm using is a, is from the rocks, the pack of rocks. Um, but you can, you know, it gives you a pretty decent effect that looks kind of like the bark of a tree as well. And in this case would work just fine. Let me see the the chat. Um <laughs> no worries man. Glad that you, you found it useful. Um I have a university assignment where I have to 3D model a character I design which would later be retopologized and animated in Maya. The question I have is would the Morph UV work for creating stylized hair and will this inter here with my retopology and UVs and wrapping process. Um, and I'm not, I, I understand the question. I'm not sure what the relevance is. Um, the, the more view E, the more view V workflow that I just show you has nothing to do with, you know, retopology or anything. If you are just creating details in this fashion, um, this is not the final UV for this mesh. It's just so that I can easily create those details in the way that I did it. At the end, I would probably retopologize this once again. Um, you know, remove if this is for animation or, you know, if I need to optimize this mesh uh, a lot more. Uh, these corner points here for a circular shape, it's not ideal. So I will have to um, make these squads as well. But that's another process. It, if you just want to follow along what I'm doing and creating these details using the Morph UV, um, you shouldn't worry at all for um, for when you come into, you know, in the topo retopology stage. That's completely different, and it's irrelevant um, for what I'm doing. Like I, the, the only reason I created UVs is literally to sculpt easier, and then you know I can delete the UVs. I don't need them anymore because I already place the the details. If that makes sense. So I'm gonna isolate this, mask this area. Uh, in fact. Hmm, this is gonna be, how can I do this? Yeah, let's mask this one out. <laughs> and let's bring back everything. And I'm just gonna shrink and blur. Let's go into a lower subdivision level so that we can blur things fast or faster.
All right. Invert that. Let's double check. All right. So the mask is working. So now what I want to do here is I'm going to save a point in the timeline right now. So I'm going to hold the control key and I'm going to click on the latest um, undo or the, on the latest point that I'm right now in. Um, oops. There we go. So now we have this point saved and I can go ahead and start adding. Oh, did it save it or did something is going on with this? It's the problem when you have heaps of undos. It's hard to get the right one. All right, there we go. So now I can go ahead and start adding all of these interesting details around, maybe around the edge. And I'm also changing the brush size as well. As I go closer, obviously, to the to the smaller portions of the horn, and then maybe make it larger as well. Um, by the way, the you can if you have like a like a Wacom tablet, or I'm sure you can do the same thing with other tablets. Um, you can map the open bracket and the close bracket in your keyboard to to the keys to any express keys in a Wacom. So uh, in my case, I use this controller, this controller thingy, so I can use these um, these rounded edge, uh, rounded controller to essentially increase or decrease the size of the brush. So I can let me show you. So I can do this, and you see the brush changes. So it's like a touch control to yeah make this larger or or not. Uh, so that's what I'm just so you know. That's what I'm using to like I can right click and do the same thing here, but when I have the the brush and I'm let's say going lower and lower and lower in terms of the size of the details, I can just use that controller and that's why you can see me or you can see the cursor sort of changing size like a lot faster without doing anything. So anyway, all of that is just to say that I'm actually changing the size of the brush as I go down um, bit by bit. And if you don't have the same type of control, you can just map it to like a couple of buttons so that you can go lower or, or higher. Anyway, so um, that's it, right? So what I'll do now is I'm going to clear the mask. And obviously, this looks this is starting to look um, all right, but I want to emphasize that more rough area of this horn, like on the top, right? So I'm going to use one of the new tools in ZBrush, which is the mask um, change points. So if I click on last points, now I have masked all of those details that we added just at the top, which is pretty awesome, right? Um, you will see it a lot faster. Yeah, see, here we go. So you see that only those points that we displace and then we change are masked. And this is an absolute game changer uh, when it comes to this type of workflows. Uh, because you know now we can just target exactly those points without anything else, without affecting anything else, and do whatever we want to this, right? Uh, and the reason I I was able to mask only the change points is because what I did at the beginning. So you see that little point, that uh, white point or gray point in the timeline, that is to to target that um, that stage is kind of like a saving the the current state of the model before you add the details. So when you click on change points, uh, which for you guys would be on the mask palette, sorry, got masking. Um, when you click on this mask change points, Sirius is gonna look at that reference point. So that one that we click uh, with control, click on the timeline, and it's gonna say, okay, the only change points that are between that point that we saved and where we currently are, are just those details, like the difference in, in that detail. So, um, now we have that, we can go ahead and maybe invert that and we can adjust those. So let's do it with preview. We can adjust this because this adjust last also takes into account that history point, which is awesome. So not only we have the ability to mask the, the previous points, right? We also 
uh, have the ability to change like the, the the intensity that we originally applied right so this is kind of like making things stronger as if we were like literally just uh, sculpting them again uh, but only those points right so for using the adjust last you don't actually need to to mask anything right um, so in fact let me go back before I mask anything so uh, yeah there is no mask um, because the adjust last has the same it works in the same way it's going to look at that point so if I press this it's going to adjust those details just the details by itself um, without doing anything. So I don't want to use this one. I just want to show you that it works in the same way. I actually want to use the mask change points, invert that mask. Uh, whoops. Let's go back, clear the mask, mask change points. There we go, invert the mask. So now only these areas are available to us, um, but I can either do it manually or go to the deformation palette and I can inflate that. So I can go to inflate, and that is going to give me all these really cool, complicated details, um, you know, that comes from the alpha of that brush that I use, this cliff uh, builder, but in combination with some masking tool. So I quite like this. Um, uh, in fact, I'm going to use a, another smooth brush. So the smooth picks and the smooth picks is another brush that comes with ZBrush um, by default, I think. Yep, so smooth picks, this one right here. And that respects a little bit of the, the distance between the, the high points and the low points in a in a mesh. So if I smooth that out, I'm gonna yeah, I will be able to smooth just the top areas of these details without affecting too much the yeah, the rest. So we can maintain this this polish level. Um, and, it, and I also take advantage of that that masking ability. There's some areas here that are a little bit too distorted, but again, this is not necessarily the final topology, so I can retopologize all of that and then just project the details so you won't have any intersecting geometry or, or anything like that. Um, another alternative, by the way, if this is creating like two, like the, the effects is the effect is too intense. Um, the alternative that you have, really, is to do it do the the, the inflate manually. So you can um, use the inflate brush, and then just go through all of these and manually inflate just the areas that you want. All right. So I'm gonna clear that mask now. Uh, I can replicate or continue doing the same process. Just do it a quick pass in here uh, to. To polish this a bit more but because i'm using the smooth peaks it's kind of like only smoothing the the areas at the top um and maintaining those nice crevices so it's not smoothing out all the the nice details that we set up so this is a pretty fun way to add these sort of details all righty i'm gonna go ahead and use these the brush just to to refine kind of like the transition in here the towards the edges you won't see any of that anyway but it's, it's good to get used to the the idea of um detailing all your model or or at least working on every angle of your model i mean when it comes down to like if you're working for a studio or something and you're doing a, a, a concept doesn't require you to have any of that or you're in the early stages of a prototype i like for me at least i never i usually don't sculpt things that you won't see in the camera so i literally sculpt for the shot um, if it is an early stages of the concept because you can spend a lot of time you know detailing things at the back that you won't see in the initial render um, and then the director would come back and say, um, yeah, this looks great, but let's go down this other path and all that extra work is lost. Whereas if you just, you know, present the the original idea, um, so you sculpt for the shot literally, and if if it goes or it gets approved, it goes to production or whatever, then you can just go back to your model and 
just refine those areas. Um, anyway, so now we have the, the nice set of horns. Um, I'm going to go ahead and bring in my standard brush. I'll reset it just in case. Uh, and what I like to do with this standard brush is just to emphasize some of these difference between the top and the bottom area of the horn. Kind of like the concave and what's the opposite? Concave, convex. So the concave would be the inner side and the convex would be the outer side, if I'm not mistaken. Can't remember. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, just a bit of the standard brush in here and if you want to push this even further you can hold with a larger brush you can hold the alt key and push things like so just to flatten them a bit perfect there's a couple of details here that need some attention just to refine them but I think for the mo most part this is looking good All right <laughs> so now we have to bring the rest of the character to the same level of um, <laughs> detail I suppose um, let's see um, I'm busy working on a skull but when I try to use a curved brush curved tube or actually the tubes the tube ones from the Geiger pack the curves are not conforming to the mesh like I think they should Seems to be drawing on a line behind the active mesh. Any idea why? Um, so if I understand what you're saying, let's say I'm going to take this guy, I'm going to bring in some of the brushes from the Geiger pack. So uh, which ones are you using? Tubes from the Geiger pack. So let, I'm going to use the basic tube. Some of these ones would not conform anyway. So if I use this one, you you want this to conform? Is that the question? They they're not meant to conform to the mesh, or actually, where is yeah? Depending on um where you are applying this mesh. So let's see. Yeah, it's fine. Uh, it, it's fine for me. Just like placing things in a weird way. But that's that's probably because uh, let me just do it in a clean mesh. Ah, uh, you know what it could be, yeah. So sometimes, sometimes when you have like saved points, that's that's that could be an issue. Yeah. All right. So that not that works. If you find that issue, check that. Um, that your timeline doesn't have like a real uh, a red line um, because that that is telling you that maybe not in the mesh that you're using um, so basically if you find a red line it means that there is a saved point somewhere in in another mesh or like in another uh, sub tool so remember that i saved a point here on the on the horns so it could be be a problem in other brushes or in other sub tools so if you see that um, just remove that and that should give you the normal effect, right? So uh, yeah, I found that as well, like that could be the problem. So now it is working, um, that it, it should conform to the, to the surface. So um, yeah, double check that. Um, so if you click on, yeah. So I, I deleted it now, but <laughs> If if I have this saved point in the undo history within the brush or within the subtool that I have selected, so in this case, I created that undo point in here, in the undo history of the horns, and I move to the face, you will see there is somewhere probably at the beginning like a red dot that indicates that that red line is somewhere else. So just remove that just by holding Control and click on that line, and then go back to your, you know, latest point, and that should work just fine. So it's one of the annoying things but awesome uh, panda panda and hey Paul thank you for every no worries man 
quick question. You recently used a circular masking menu. Ah, this thing. That's a Wacom menu. So, sorry. Um, so that keeps popping out on your servers. And you don't know what the shortcut is. Ah. Okay, so if you're seeing this thing, and that means you have a Wacom tablet, right? Uh, you can have that with any Wacom tablet, really. So those are called the um, the Express, no, not the Express screens, the on-screen something. <laughs> um, so all you have to do is bring your, tab your Wacom tablet uh, settings, and you can change the shortcut you're probably pressing, you know, right-click or something. Um, it it is going to be very different from mine. I have mine mapped to the middle mouse button of this uh, Pro Pen, so it depends on on what you have set up. So just bring your tablet settings, and it will be there. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna use my damn standard brush to define this this guy a bit more. Maybe increase the resolution a bit. And I'm also going to set these back to this normal smooth. And I'm just going to start adding some like indication of those, like the major faults. But again, once we're once we're back to this mode of uh, just sculpting, <laughs> it's um it's a bit more like chilling. There's no there's no tricks. This is just spending the time, refining volumes, refining, you know, for example, the the mouth is just literally just a line indicating what where it should be, but then we need to spend the time playing around with the with the volumes. So. Maybe with the clay brush, just to use a different brush. Um, and maybe we can also use the smooth picks. Oh, sorry. Yeah, smooth picks. Um, and at this stage, you know, even though this is still super sketchy, I like to use the, the clay brush, just the normal clay brush, because it allows you to, to clean or to add volume, but it, it's a lot cleaner. Doesn't create those extra ridges. So, you know, that it comes down to like personal preference. At the end of the day, if you use the clay builder brush to add volume faster, you can still clean that later on. So, not a big deal. All right, I think I'm gonna exaggerate that nose area a bit more. Um, and I'm gonna start also playing around with the, with the eyelids because we need to define those as well. So something, you know, this is um, kind of like a, I don't know, I, I would call it like a rookie mistake, <laughs> but you know, it's something that over the time, I, like I've learned with experience as well. And that I see, for example, some of my students, um, that I have like have gone through the program already for like the extra mile or something. They are like 
very attentive to these type of things. <laughs> so I'm just going to mention that um, for the eyelids, sometimes you, you might tend to keep them like very close to, to the eyeball, uh, but the eyelids are quite thick. And, you know, and one of the things that it's important to emphasize in a character like this, for example, is the, uh, if you have the eyes open, there's going to be that fold of the top eyelid falling uh, or folding backwards. Um, so unless you have like the eyes semi-close, but in this case, um, what I like to do is with something like the mask lasso, mask that sort of top eyelid. Uh, maybe refine it a bit more. Right? Um, and use something like the inflate or the standard brush just to add more meat to that. And then if you invert that, I'm also going to hide it, Control H. In my case, I have um, a custom key for that. I can go ahead and continue, start adding like volume on on top of that eyelid. And I would I would keep that, that fall in there. And I can use the remove brush as well. So that is going to add a lot of realism to that. Same deal with the with the bottom eyelid. Obviously, you don't have that, you know, that really strong fold or very evident fold. But it's still pretty pretty thick. All right. So <laughs> sometimes um I don't know if you you know if you do this but when I'm when I'm working with this type of thing like um I tend for some reason I tend to do the expression of what I'm working on so like this character has like the the eyes kind of like semi closed so I tend to just work with it with the eyes like this like kind of like with the same expression um and I and I caught myself on the mirror the other day doing that and it was fun, pretty funny but um I was doing like um like a like a really expressive character with um with a yeah like a like a strong expression of anger and I was just like doing the same faces <laughs> uh, while I was doing uh, what I was sketching so sometimes with these type of characters I look like I'm like a bit sleepy sculpting but it's just because I'm doing the same trying to to think about the you know I don't I don't think I do it consciously but it's it's just funny. Um, I don't know if you do. <laughs> maybe I'm just weird, but that's um that's what happens. It's the same thing as when I'm doing something like Star Wars or something. I just think about the noises of you know the 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 lightsabers and that sort of thing, uh, which is you know it's not it's not for everyone. All right. So still pretty sketchy, but now you can start to see some like some volumes happening um and i just like to use this clay brush and then just do a little I'm, I'm pressing like really really softly in fact sometimes i just remove a lot more of that um c intensity um but just doing these little bits and pieces as you refine the the volumes and the blocking that you already have it sort of helps to bring another layer of realism to the to the sculpt um you know this is something that i wouldn't do until like i'm 100 percent happy with the blocking uh, but just to just to move faster um the idea really is if you press very softly on the on the tablet or you ha you don't have a lot of um yeah a lot of intensity in the c intensity um it just doesn't affect the mesh as much, but it does create all of these semi bumpy areas that are more intentional. Uh, sometimes that could be an issue, but in this case are intentional uh, to create the the subtle differences in in the skin 
in a way. So it's, yeah, as you see, it's just more of the same. Um, what I'll do maybe is maybe work on these areas a bit more, just to integrate the, the horns. And the ears a bit as well. Um, but yeah, again, because these processes are a bit more repetitive and kind of like somehow boring to watch. Uh, if you guys have any other questions, if you put them in the chat, I'm happy to to talk about all the stuff while I'm, you know, doing the same action. Um. What's the re the red demon with the smoking pipe call? The red demon with the smoking pipe. Not sure what that means. <laughs> I've never used the basic clay brush until the creature workshop. Awesome. Well, I'm glad that you got introduced to that. Uh, it is really really powerful, and uh, yeah, we use that quite a bit in the in the workshop. Um, hey Gaston, how you doing? Uh, Diana Cui, no, no soy español, pero hablo español. Um, Hellboy, no, this is, I mean, it kind of like has some Hellboy vibes, uh, because it's the Pan's Labyrinth version of that. It's like my version of the Pan's Labyrinth from Del Toro, so kind of like. Similar. Um, a red di a red demon with a pipe. I don't think I've done like a demon smoking. Um, can't think of anything. I, I mean, I've done a red demon, but it's not smoking anything. <laughs> so I don't know if that's the one that you looking for if you google um pecator and just maybe put my nickname pablander you might find it so pecator and it's in my art station as well All right, so we are getting there and we have about 10 minutes left. Um, so what I'll do is I'm going to jump into the move brush to do some final adjustments in here. Uh, we can continue working on this guy later on, maybe. If you guys like this type of stuff. But um, I think to, to wrap it up today, uh, what I'll do is I'm just going to do a quick retopology of this dude. Um, yeah, I think we can keep the, the ears separately for now. Um, and this guy might have like some maybe stylized hair, like beard or something. Um, I know the, the original concept or the original character design has it. Uh, so I'm going to you know, maintain that, those type of things, but, you know, make it my own. <laughs> so now this has a red topologize, nice version of this. Uh, we can go to the lower subdivision now. Maybe we can reconstruct one more. So we have this low res mesh and the high res mesh as well. And we can subdivide it one more time. 
Um, and now we can go ahead and do, you know, some something else. Uh, so I, the only reason I re apologize is so that I can do some details a lot easier. So I'm going to work on the kind of like design or pattern that this guy has in the forehead. Again, it's not the same thing. So I, I rarely, <laughs> to be honest, I rarely copy things. Um, I don't know. I, I think it's a, a really good practice. But when I tend to copy something, I always end up like mixing a little bit of my own ideas. But yeah, so it, it it is the pan's labyrinth thing, but yeah, infused with some other stuff. <laughs> All righty. So what I'll do again is kind of like refine this a bit more just to exaggerate the difference, sharpen those those lines, and then we can go ahead and um, divide this one more time. Actually, I haven't done a single save, so <laughs> maybe let's do that first. Um, Maybe we can extend that interesting set of patterns to other areas. I know the the concept has some stuff like around the chest. Anyway, something to play around with. Um, maybe something around the chin as well. All right. So um, let's go ahead and subdivide this one more time. So now we have 2 million polygons. Um, and I'm going to use the standard brush just to bring these edges of this pattern a little bit higher than the rest. And that just should complete the, the effect for this. Sort of like, you know, to, to create that idea of that this is kind of like embedded in the, in the actual skin and it's not just a wrinkle or something. I'm going to go into solo mode as well. And I also have the smooth peaks enabled, so I can add a bit of volume and then go ahead and smooth, but it's going that smooth peaks is going to respect that that crevice. So if I do this and I go ahead and smooth, you see for the most part that crevice is kept, um, which is good. All right. And I think that's about it, maybe. Some extra volumes around here. Sorry, I just tend to, uh, you know, <laughs> when I'm when I'm doing this type of thing that, again, is very repetitive, and at the same time, it's kind of like thinking about the design, 
a little bit, I just tend to zone out. <laughs> and then I just stop talking. Um, um, let's see. Um, I'm answering the guy's question. I'm not sure what that means. Will you ever create a character course with full body, with arms and legs? I understand it's uh, the same principle. Cool to see the full, complete character realize. Um, yeah, I. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, one of the key aspects of when it comes down to like a course or doing a, like a course program or something that you want to follow along and do it is is to actually get things done. Um, and one of the, I would say, the downfalls of you know, pretending that you can in a shorter amount of time without being able to do the the program first, create a full body character is a bit too uh, ambitious and it could be out of the scope. So, and that could lead to a whole bunch of different, you know, issues like, you know, not not because you wouldn't be able to do it, but if you, if you target uh, something more realistic and like you said, it's, um, it's the matter of re replicating the same process. If you target something that is a bit more realistic, you will have a sense of accomplishment that is a lot greater than that doing a full character. Um, so the the only reason I avoid doing that type, that type of thing is just in terms of the scope. Uh, I could do like a full body body character easily, but you know that's not the point of like teaching the process and teaching something. Um, that can be replicated. So at the end of the day, if you want to do a full body character, it's just the same thing. Um, but it, when, what, it, what it comes down to is the the application of the of the tools and the process. And I think just to answer your question, I would definitely, I could definitely show how to do that. It's just what it comes down to is like the, the time and, and the scope of the project. Um, just to to make it happen really but like you know for instance if you if you see some of the work that the the extra mile students are doing you know the actual course is limited to just a bust um you know from the waist up but most of the, the or most of the students because it is a lifetime access program and you know once they've gone through the first stages uh, they can come back and follow the same principle and they do full body characters so um, I'm just thinking from the top of my head, uh, Daniel Colombo, for example, he did the Skull Lord, um, which was just a bust, really, but it was an amazing, an amazing work. Um, that's that was his, that was his project for the first time that he uh, went through the program. But nowadays he's working um, on his second big project, which is a full body female character with a another kind of like creature beast that um, kind of like the companion. Um, so he's not only doing a single character with full body and everything, he's doing two characters at once. <laughs> so um, that just goes to show that it's all about the process and understanding the workflows. And that's my, that's my main goal really when I create a course more than, you know, more than anything, <laughs> more than anything. Um, is to be able to show um, the pro the process, but in fact, if you check the um, the Ultimate Sewerage Guide course, right, the course that I have that teaches, you know, absolute beginners how to use Sewerage and how to understand a bit Sewerage, that's a full body character, that mushroom character. Sorry, I don't know if I, I just branched out. I don't know if I answered the question <laughs> originally, um, but I do have courses that, you know, are full body. All right. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead and leave it here and maybe just do a bit of trim to flatten these areas. And when I, whenever I use the trim, the trim brush, it automatically makes things a lot more stylized <laughs> for some reason. It's just, um, well, for some reason, no, it's just because it is, it is an easy way to, to refine the planes, um, and, and emphasize the different planes or the difference between the planes and that ultimately helps with the 
with the stylize the stylization. And it's also a great tool to not only flatten certain areas but to polish more organic stuff like this. And because we now have the low low res mesh as well, we can add you know two tweaks that are kind of like large larger type of proportions. So maybe make the neck a little bit longer. That sort of stuff. All right, so I think that's that's it for today, guys. Um, hopefully, you found this series of tips that I share with you today useful. Um, we can we can leave it here and just come back to it later, or like next next time. Um, it is definitely a fun project to to work on, and it has a bunch of different surfaces, which is pretty cool. Cool. Um, yep, yeah, so <laughs> I'm gonna leave it here, guys. Thanks again for tuning. Um, it's time to, to wrap it up for today. And yeah, so if you're interested in like other, other types of workflows, um, like someone asked at the beginning, in if you go to my YouTube channel, there is a new uh, completed free workshop on the Adobe 3D tools as well. Like you can watch that there. Um, and I use ZBrush obviously to, to create those uh, base meshes. Um, so it's kind of like a, like a pottery scene, like a three 3D pottery scene, uh, which is pretty cool. And just letting you know, in case you're not part of my uh, email list, this morning I sent out that email um, that has, you know, the link to the entire playlist. So now you can watch the entire playlist. Um, Yep, so I'm gonna leave it here guys and I will see you in a couple of weeks uh, right before the the Silver Summit, oops, <laughs> sorry. I just moved my, my 3D mouse. Um, yeah, so just before the Silver Summit, um, I'm gonna do one more one more stream uh, on the 19th, on the, on the week of the 19th. So I'll see you in a couple of weeks. Have a good one.